the Productize Podcast. My name is Brian Castle. Thank you for tuning in today. You're going to hear my conversation today with Kyle Brown. He's the founder of WPSAS.net. And you may think of that as SaaS, like software as a service, but it's not. It's actually WPSupportAsAService.net. And basically, Kyle has managed to productize customer support and he delivers it really, really efficiently. He's got a a list of clients, mostly selling WordPress plugins, but I know that he's also expanded into helping out companies who sell SaaS products. And so basically his company enables you to outsource that tier one support, all those common questions that you're getting from customers who are too lazy to read your documentation. They handle all that for you to free you up. And and you'll hear all about that in, in the interview. But it was just really interesting to hear his story about how he came from managing thousands of customer support reps and locations for a huge enterprise company like Verizon into this bootstrapped world of managing and handling customer support for small software companies and how he's translated a lot of his uh, knowledge, especially around processes and systems, a lot of really good stuff. And I actually picked his brain quite a bit near the end in terms of how to how to manage our Help Scout inbox and some customer support best practices, some tips when it comes to tagging, really helpful stuff, a lot of actionable stuff. We covered a lot of ground. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Kyle Brown from WP SaaS. All right, I'm here with Kyle Brown from WP SaaS. Kyle, how's it going? It's going good, Brian. How are you? Doing good. So thanks for uh, thanks for joining me today. So um, you and I have, have known each other for a couple of years now, I think, you know, around the uh, the microconf crowd, the WordPress crowd, different different circles there. So before we kind of dive into your your backstory, why don't we talk a bit about what you're focused on today, real quick? So WP SaaS, like what what is that about, and and how do you spend your time on it today? Sure, um, and thanks for having me. And uh, you're right. I think it's been a couple of years. Uh, time flies when you're having fun, right? So uh, WP SaaS, it stands for a WordPress support as a service, WordPress support as a service, .NET. Uh, and it essentially is what I'm spending the bulk of my time on now. I'm, I'm focused like a lot of entrepreneurs. I am cheating somewhat and spending my time in multiple places. But my primary focus is uh, WP SaaS .NET. Yeah, I think I know. I think I know a thing or two about that. Yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about that. And at a high level, it's literally what the acronym uh, means, support as a service. So what we do there is we provide tier one email based technical support to WordPress product owners. At this time, it's primarily uh, plugin owners. And we provide that tier one level of support for that business owner so that that business owner can spend time developing or scaling or marketing the business or just uh, laying out on the beach or all of the above. (laughs) I I mean, I love it. So they have, so if you're selling a plugin and you've got lots of customers, they need help with onboarding and and technical issues and installing it and and just customer support. um, Once you get lots of customers, especially for WordPress products, that can just become it can just overwhelm you with emails and back and forth and keep you from from working on the product and so at that point they can come to you and say so like how does that work like do they just give you access to the plugin and then your team kind of learns it and and like what does that look like so the onboarding process is very simple let me take a, a quick step back and give a brief bit of background so a couple of years ago looking for an opportunity And the WordPress space had been something that had been recommended quite frequently by uh, other entrepreneurs, primarily in the Micropreneur Academy space. A lot of the people that I've built relationships with there would often recommend, you know, WordPress as a place to start if you're looking to do something. So uh, upon looking around that space, I noticed that there was a lot of need for support. Uh, WordPress obviously is an open source product. Um, Open source is great for getting your hands on something that you can use to create. Um, However, for the end user, a lot of times that support isn't necessarily as readily available as the product that gets created using this open source technology. So I saw a pain there. And as far as something that's open source and free that someone's giving away, you, you kind of deserve, you get what you pay for, right? So if you're an end user, you've downloaded something that's free, 
you, you can't necessarily expect support beyond what the creator of the product says they'll give you. However, what I did notice was that there was this whole world of uh, businesses that have been built around small businesses, mostly some quite big uh, that have been built around the same concept, except they were charging for the product. Yeah. A, a novel concept in the WordPress world to actually charge <laughs> for your plugin. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's, uh, that's uh, another topic. Uh, altogether, <laughs> right. Yep. Um, but that's what these business owners were doing. And a lot of them happen to be developers, engineers, designers. So uh, I have a bit of a background in customer support, right? So I've spent uh, over a decade at Verizon Communications managing call centers there. And we're talking high, high volume, over 7 million plus customers for, uh, let's just say, DSL and Fios alone. DSL was more popular before now it's more files, cell phones, whatever you you know can think of that you would need help for. Uh, my point being, we would t- take these huge volumes of phone calls, around sixty five thousand a day, and when you're doing those kinds of volumes, you have to be very effective at how you handle them. So most of my time was spent learning how to be very very efficient at handling support requests, whether they were chat, email, phones, etc. So I'm I'm trying to I knew whatever I wanted to do I would attempt to leverage that background, and uh, I'm, so I attempted to leverage that background with the WordPress ecosystem, and um, I just saw that there was a need there for providing support. That's interesting. I mean, I I knew that you worked for Verizon for a while. I I actually didn't realize that you were involved in managing the customer support uh, systems and and operations there. And obviously, I see the connection now. <laughs> so so yeah, I mean, let's let's go back. Let's get into your story a little bit. So wh- where are you based today and where are you from? Uh, so currently I'm in um, Fort Washington, which is a little suburb uh, outside of the Washington, D.C. area. Generally, when I'm talking to people who aren't from here, I just say the Washington, D.C. area because everybody knows Washington, D.C., right? Yep. Yep. And uh, is that where you're from originally? Uh, so I actually was born and raised in the, the District of Columbia uh, itself and moved outside to uh, when I mean... I, Close. We're talking five minutes um, outside of the city uh, about a decade ago. And what did what did your parents do? Uh, so my mother uh, actually was a worked for a lobbying agency. Several of them, in fact, up on K Street. Yeah, that's that's sort of common business here. Uh, and my father was a uh, police officer. Yeah, but my mother did most of the work. So. What like early on as you as you kind of grew up, uh, you know, going to college, go like after like what what did you want to get into as as a career before you got into business? So um, did I did attend school, didn't finish. Quite frankly, was bored out of my mind. I think most most founders are. I think yeah, I, I've noticed that. <laughs> uh, computer science major, loved to learn. That just wasn't my attention wasn't kept by the slow pace of the university. I was learning 10 times more on nights and weekends on my own. And school was a distraction. So didn't finish that. Kind of just went straight into the workforce, went to the phone company at what most would call an entry level job is the telephone man. And kind of just worked my way up through the ranks there the old fashioned way. And one day someone tapped me on the shoulder and asked me if I wanted to become a move over into this project management type of role. And at that time, internet access was really just a baby. It was just hitting major saturation in the United States of America. So this company, Verizon, was turning up these support centers to support this product that they were selling like hotcakes. And someone tapped me and brought me over. Uh, Actually, for the first three months, couldn't believe I had made that decision. Because the job really was much more of a management job. It was not a technical job. And at that point in my career, all that really, all that really done was technical work. And uh, what I learned was that uh, interesting story. So he calls me up one day, the guy that hired me, his name was Tom. He says, um, so by now, Kyle, you, you realize that this is really not a technical job. And I says, yes, yes, you're right. I do realize that. And I was wondering why you... <laughs> He hired me for this job. And he said something that kind of stuck with me for the rest of my up until this very day, which was, you know, the technical part is one thing. And if you're good at that, that's great. You can have a great career. The management part, same thing. 
if you're good at that, you can have a great career. He said, but what's missing in the space now, this guy was much older than me. I learned a lot from him. He said, what's missing in the space now is someone who can fit in the middle, who can talk to both the developers and the business people. He said, you figure out how to do that well, you'll never have to worry about working again. So That's some wisdom right there. It was some wisdom. And uh, it meant a lot more to me about a year later, but I, you know, I stuck with it and uh, I was learning. So I didn't really have anything to lose. And it just really did give it gave me a much better idea of what the larger picture looks like. You know, I'm still passionate about the technology first. I'm still going to be a, a person who loves the technology first, loves to to write code. But the business piece of it just gave me something that I feel was honestly that I hadn't really paid much attention that's so interesting. You know, making that transition from being a technician into managing other people, I think a lot of people struggle with it. Or if they haven't made that transition yet, there's some fear there or they don't even want to get into that. And that's even myself too. Like going back several years, I was a freelance designer and the thought of managing other people like wasn't really interesting to me until I started getting the itch of like, well, if this thing is going to grow, then we're going to need to get other people on board. So what did that look like like early on? Like, So you're put in this position of managing, what was it? It was, it was like a support center at, at Verizon? Um, so actually it was um, seven uh, support centers scattered all over the world. Some in the United States, some outside of the United States. Most were outsourced contract arrangements. And this is like incoming phone support? This was incoming phone support primarily. You could say 75% of it was incoming phone support. Um, there was another portion of it that was uh, chat and another portion that was email. And again, you think back to the early 2000s. OK, so this is things were just taking off of the Internet in terms of large saturation in the country. So email and chat were not big support vehicles at the time, but they did exist because the company was always constantly looking for ways to reduce costs. I think a lot of people who run any sort of online business today, but especially software businesses, and definitely especially WordPress uh, software businesses, deal with customer support on a day-to-day basis. But comparing supporting customers for a WordPress plugin to supporting thousands, like millions of customers for Verizon, both are technically customer support, but they're two completely different worlds. Is there anything that you like... What are like the main differences? What what might be actually similar between the two? Anything that you can kind of connect there? This is one of the things. This is, that's a great question. It's got me thinking. So one of the one of my challenges, to be quite frank uh, with you, Brian, when deciding to do something on my own in the startup space, was that I am coming from an enterprise software background, right? I'm coming from this huge company that makes billions of dollars a year and everything is about efficiency, profitability. You know, you got to hit those quarterly numbers to keep Wall Street happy. It's really a different world. And when I started venturing out into working with small business owners, including WordPress business owners, one of the things I noticed right away was it was really hard for me to find, to apply all of those things that I had learned to these smaller companies for a multitude of reasons. But there were always similarities and there always will be similarities in regardless of the size of the business. But just to give you an example, a lot of the folks that I've met in the WordPress space are really, again, engineers, designers, not that many business people that I have met personally. And a lot of those folks tend to have a mentality where they just want to build a product, you know what I mean, and get it out into the hands of people. And if they can make some money, then, you know, they'd like to do that, too. Yeah, it's like dealing with customer support was never their goal. (laughs) Not just that, all of the back office stuff, right? Lawyers, HR, some cases, sales pages, you know, any of that stuff that's not really what you think about when you are trying to build something. But yet every business has to have those non-sexy back office things. And that was, again, one of the reasons why that led me to tie the two together is because I knew they needed it. And even if they don't know they need it, they will know if their business is scale, if they're fortunate enough to actually start generating some profitability and uh, the business has become sustainable. You will learn this 
six to 12 months, 18 months out, depending on how fast you grow, you will without a doubt see the need and have to address it. And what I had as a good reference, although I already believed this and knew it, I had a couple of very good reference points and examples of where it had already happened. You just look at companies like WooCommerce or another example that I, I like to refer to is Carl Hancock and Gravity Forms. You just sit back and look at how they operate today and you see a lot of these same things that we're offering with WP SaaS. The difference is we've productized it and made it into something that will scale with your business, whereas those companies have, uh, you know, large teams and are doing very well. Uh, someone starting out can't necessarily afford to outsource that. So that, that was one of the other reasons why uh, we did it. We saw that it was solving a few pain points, and that was that's just one of them. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, customer support is actually very invisible to most customers, right? Like you, you kind of send a message through, whether it's an intercom chat or, or an email or something or a support ticket, and then you kind of just wait for the response. And some companies do a really great job of being there, getting you a quick response and actually solving your problem. And then others do a really poor job, whether it takes them like three days to get back to you or, or they do get back to you the same day, but they're not actually solving your problem. They're just like, oh, yeah, we received your question. Now we'll get back to you at some point, you know, <laughs> you know, and I, and I feel like as these like hot startups grow, you can start to see which ones are actually investing in in those systems and which ones are kind of treating it as an afterthought. And certainly for a, a small bootstrapped software product, it's always going to be at back of the mind, like not a top priority because you need to get your product out there. But soon enough, support becomes your sales channel. Correct. And you need to get those customers on board. Like, how do you um, how do you see that kind of evolving today with the people that you're in touch with? Sure. So um, the clients we work with now, and we'll be doing some case studies here in the near future and making those available to the public because my goal is to not talk about what these sort of back office services, in this case, support can do for your business. But I'm going to show you by presenting these cases to you from your own peers. The companies that we're working with now, we've never had anyone not uh, save time and not be able to then take that time and repurpose it to improve their development cycle speeds or to spend more time with their families or to focus more on marketing. It's almost always worked without a doubt in every single case. As far as convincing folks that this is the right thing to do, um, again, that's uh, one of the things I learned uh, early on in you know the startup game is that you know if your business idea requires you to change someone's mindset, then you probably want to find uh, another idea because mindset is a very difficult thing to change. But the thing with support is you can't deny it. If you're having any level of success with your product, then you will have support. It's going to be there. You can't wish it away. You can't build something that's so awesome that nobody needs help with it. Even the mighty Apple, who is arguably one of the best companies in the world at creating things that just work, has extensive forums online and call centers and all of the things that all of the other companies have. People will just need help for a variety of reasons. It's just a part of the business. Yeah. So I actually want to jump back a little bit to when you first started WP SaaS. I don't know if it was always called, was it called that from the very beginning? I, I seem to remember you doing this same service, but like, what did it look like from, from day one? It was always called WP SaaS. It was what we started with. And someone actually pitched that name to me and it made sense. And we just started using it. It's interesting, like how it stands for, you know, uh, customer support as a service. Obviously, people think of SaaS like a software as a service, but absolutely that play on words, and, and and you know, it was sort of like, well, if we say SaaS, everybody who's a techie, right, will get it. They'll know what that means. If you put the WP in front of it, well, another group would know what it means. But if you put it all together, um, they may all be just confused enough to go and ask you what it means. <laughs> That's the opportunity to pitch it. So. I like that. So today, you know, your your pricing tiers are, are pretty clear cut and you have like a starter plan, a pro plan, a business enterprise. And it looks like today you're breaking it up between like the starter, you get up to 180 responses per month. And then the next tier up 360 responses, and then 540 um, and then above that. So it's it's pretty clear and simple pricing. 
But you're investigating the the WordPress space and you're seeing that there's a need for customer support. Like what was your first step in putting this type of service together? One of the things that I had going in my favor or um, as some call it an unfair advantage was that I had over a decade in the space. Right. So I knew how operations worked and I knew I wouldn't have to spend a lot of time figuring that part out. What I didn't know was whether I could find enough people who were interested that were in the WordPress space that would be willing to swipe a credit card. Right. So, you know, I put up a landing page and I decided from jump that this was going to be a quick validation period where I was going to go out. I was going to try a few different things to get the message out in front of people and see how they responded. And if it didn't return favorable results, then, hey, we just shut it down and move on to something else. And what did you put on that very first version of the of the landing page? Uh, so basically on that very first version of the landing page, I actually still have that. I was just looking at it the other day. It's funny. You should ask me. Basically just told a short story about what happens when most people start out in as WordPress business owners, how you build a product and you launch the product and, hey, you got lucky enough to have some customers and then you find out you have quite a few customers and they all need a percentage of them need your help. So you kind of like identified the pain and you described the pain and, and then the solution. Did you have like an email opt-in or did you have a, like, did you show pricing or, or buy now or a form or what, how did people, what was the call to action? It was a one pager. It started out with the pain and it, it, it then progressed to here's the dream. All right. And then there was a fix, a big shout out to Amy Hoy, whose content uh, definitely helped us put this together. And at the bottom, we uh, just dropped in uh, uh, an opt-in box, right, to collect emails, probably 500 words, if that. So you put this landing page together. You have the email opt-in box there. Did you show pricing, like what the price point would be on the content or not yet? No, we didn't. We didn't mention pricing. We only mentioned all of the benefits. Uh, we mentioned that you would free up your time. We really focused hard in on the pain we focus very, very hard on the pain that you'd be able to free up your time to develop, thinking that most of our audience are going to be developers and engineers who just want to do that, and they don't necessarily want to do the support full time. Very cool. So once you had this this landing page put together, what was your next step? How did you get it out in front of people? So I basically did some uh, Google AdWords, right? We threw some AdWords, uh, AdWords budget at it. We then switched to some Facebook ads. And then we tried some LinkedIn ads. We probably did each of them, I'll say about three weeks apiece. And although I originally set out for this to only be a seven day or short term validation, I knew I needed to give some time for the ads to actually work, but didn't spend a lot of time developing them. Very, you know, brief to the point. Uh, Same messaging that was on the sales page went into the ads and the results were horrible. But to be quite honest with you, Brian, the results were horrible. The ad, the conversions that we did get, the people that we did have actually make inquiries and sign up were asking us questions about uh, things that had nothing to do <laughs> with um, a support as a service business training and everything else. So I was just about to put the nail in this thing. And then I realized that I wanted to try something that I had never really tried before, which is uh, cold emailing. So I started reaching out to people who I knew and who were in the WordPress space who had plug-in businesses. And literally the very first person I reached out to said they were interested and wanted to talk to me about it immediately. That's awesome. So so this was like warm, like people that you knew personally, like from meeting in, in these networking or who was in that first group that you reached out? So I say cold emailing, I guess that's not really a hundred percent true. It's cold because it's cold in terms of my usual approach is not to go to somebody and ask them something, right? I'm more of a a persuasive marketing kind of guy. I want your attention when you already know something is there for you, but it was to your point warm because these were people I, I had already identified that uh, knew had these businesses already in the space. Are these people that you've met before or did you go to like the WordPress directory and like? No. So I had met them online. I had never met them face to face. I knew them from some I knew from Micropreneur Academy. Others I just knew from different social media channels, you know. Got it. I really like that step though. And and I've done it myself, like starting with a small group of people that 
you've somehow networked with before who are in the space that you're that you're tar- like just get yourself into the space that you're targeting it it just makes sense but so many people are trying to do that automated you know hands off just throw money at facebook or google and they'll just bring leads to you magically it doesn't doesn't really work that way especially early on didn't work for us <laughs> yeah. Yeah. um so we did that and we chatted and i knew i had something i knew something different was going on because the person started stalking me and I don't mean stalking in a crazy type of way, but I mean that I was hearing more from them than I was having to contact them. You know, you understand what I mean? Um, I knew there was interest. And shortly thereafter, I ended up uh, meeting the person face to face at a conference. Just so happens that conference was only about two weeks after we had started the, after I had reached out online and um, you know, it just, they were on board we brought them on. We started providing the support. We worked out some processes, got them in place, and we were sort of off to the races. So that was your first client, which was a WordPress plugin? Yes. And so from that first batch of, of emails, how many clients did you bring on? Well, it wasn't even a batch. It was literally just um, it was just the one. The first person I reached out to agreed. And after that, uh, you know, I wanted to spend some time tweaking and making sure that we had something that we could scale and and put more systems around and and grow. But then I started receiving referrals, you know, and this, this first person then brings on another product at the, maybe a month later, because they had more than one plugin actually. And they bring on that second product. And then maybe a couple of days after that, and this is not make believe this is literally, I couldn't believe it was happening this way because I'd heard this story so many times. Right. Not too far after that, I get a referral from someone else who I had talked to about the service. They weren't in the business of WordPress plugins, but they were an entrepreneur and they knew a lot of people who were in that business. So, I mean, really, in the first 30 days, the first 30 days, we were profitable and we were in the four figure a month range in terms of revenue. By the end of the year, we were at five figures. And that was two years, just over two years ago. Nice. So that was like 2015. Very cool. I love it. And so early on, was that just you or did you have other people on your team? So when I started, it was literally just me. And you went through the process of getting access to their plugin and doing the support, but like figuring out the process along the way? Yeah. So what we started with was the paid version of the product, right? All the bells and whistles turned on, all the functionality active and just walk through it, learned what it did, how to use it, you know, leveraged any documentation that existed. And we took it from there and just started to uh, study the existing support flow that the business owner was already using. So we sort of just insert ourselves at the time. It was just me. I insert myself into that process flow as if I was an employee at the company. Just mine the data that's there already in the existing uh, ticketing tool. Uh, and then as the new requests come in, over time, you know, between leveraging the data that's in the, the support forums or in the ticketing tool or in the documentation and then working really closely with the plugin developer or their lead developer, owner or lead developer, you know, it's just a matter of time, usually very quickly, by less than a week, you can come up to speed on what plugins capable of doing and be uh, supporting it adequately uh, going forward. Yeah. Okay. So then where did you go from there? So you, you got some referrals, your revenue is growing. Like when did you bring someone on to help you out? Um, so I'm a big, big, as you know, believer in systems and putting processes in place and people in place. Uh, so about day 60, uh, once I got to the point where we were at the, I think the fourth product, I had already put the processes in place and I'm I brought someone on who had done some work for me in the past. This person wasn't a support person per se, but I had a good working relationship with them and I knew they could be trained. What my theory was with the right training and the right process and the right management, they would be good at support. Plugged them in and, uh, you know, they hit the ground running. It was pretty smooth running at that point. And shortly thereafter, I brought in another person who Nikki is her name. She's great. She pretty much handles all of the billing 
related issues, refund related issues for all of our products, basic first customer touch kinds of things, making sure account licenses are correct and that that sort of thing. It's, it's like you guys as a service, you provide the tier one support, but even within that, there's like tier zero and then, and then tier one kind of. Sure. There's. So, you know, I like to think of tier one as essentially everything that doesn't have to do with there being an actual defect of some type in the product. Right, right. Like you could you could find the answer in documentation, but people are too lazy for that and they just want to ask someone. Oh, yeah, yeah. Those are your words, not mine. But, <laughs> you know, um, you're right. I mean, for whatever reason, some people feel like they won't they, they're paying. So why should they look through documentation? Sometimes it's not in the documentation, to be quite honest. You know, I I probably send way too many support emails just because I'm too I'm too lazy to go look it up in their knowledge base, and I know that like you guys can get back to me in two days. That's fine. I just want to ask the question and be done with it. Yeah, well, two <laughs> days. Just a side note: two days. We do two hours. Uh, two days is just ridiculous, and uh, three days is actually the average response time for most internet businesses before you hear the first response, and that doesn't include auto responders. You know, you're you're right about that, and and there are some SaaS that I'm I'm paying over a hundred bucks a month to that have taken more than three days to get back to me about stuff, and that I just I just find amazing. You know, well, you know, um, earlier you asked me where I saw this going, and that's one of the places I see this going is, uh, you know, eventually at some point in time, even the online space, the expectations will reach what they are now for the uh, real world, the brick and mortar world. That is online space is very real world, but brick and mortar, more traditional world. People pay fifteen dollars a month for some services out there and they expect to get answers immediately for any questions that they have. And I feel like the. Uh, not just the WordPress space, but the SaaS space in general is heading in that direction. People are going as the spaces become more and more full and there's more and more products out there. Customer service is going to start to be one of the things that determines or breaks the tie, if you will, um, and earns people's uh, business. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to put it that way, like breaking the tie. But, you know, so a lot of people listening to this are getting into productized services or they're running productized services, some doing software, some doing other stuff. You're a process guy and, and you've started to, I mean, you've basically productized customer support. So what does your operation look like? You know, it, it sounds so easy to just hire one, hire two people, hire three people to, to start doing what you're doing. But I'm sure that in practice, it's harder than it seems. Like what did they need in order to truly get it off your plate so that you're not just managing other like what a lot of people who are new to hiring, what, what happens typically is they hire someone and then they spend all their time trying to train them and retrain them or kind of do their jobs for them. Like, how did you kind of get that that rolling in, in your business? Um, so, again, using an unfair advantage, I've, I've seen this done so many times at a very high level. And I don't mean that to brag. I just mean to say that I think it's important that, you know, when you're when your company, when you work for a company that's earning that kind of money that a Verizon would or a phone company would, it's all about continuing to earn that money. And when your mindset is focused on maintaining such a high level, you have to do things in a way that support that. Right. So uh, I already knew what I needed. Um, I'm, I'm going to say this and it, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be fair for me to say that you just do X, Y and Z and it'll all work out because we're all different. We all have different experiences. But. I say I'll say this. The three most important things were a having a very, very good understanding of how I thought that things should work from A to Z. Right. Have. And, and I knew those things and what they were because I was already doing them myself before I went out to hire someone. After that being number one. Well, actually, before you move on, that's a really important point. I, I like that a lot because and I've done the same thing in, in audience ops, you know, like, cause when it comes to customer support or creating content or developing or designing or whatever it is that you're doing, like there's going to be 50 different ways that you can do the same thing. Sure. Everybody's going to want to do it their own way. But if you define your methodology or your best practice and then build that into your, your process, it makes everything run much smoother. What you're saying is absolutely correct. One is very important because you have to you're the business owner. You have to set the strategy. You, you're the one with the vision. You have to dictate how you would like for things to work in your business. And once you've got an idea of what that looks like, 
I'd say you need to get it documented and it needs to be documented in such a format that you can take it and hand it to a person who may not be you and more more than likely obviously won't be you, but with the right strategy in hand, they can take it and execute it. So this person may be very, very good. Let's just use this example of um, maybe they're good at WordPress and then they are good at installing plugins and uninstalling them in basic configuration. but you're going to hand them some tools that they can use to become very, very effective troubleshooters based on a series of steps that you have already proven work. Yeah, like if you go through this troubleshooting process, then you're going to find the answer. Exactly. Or you'll get close enough that over time you'll be able to figure out the answer on your own. And getting that process documented in a way that's uh, portable to others. And the third and probably most important and highly overlooked a lot of times is maintenance. A process, a lot of people shy away from process and documentation because it's uh, usually a heavy upfront time dedication or a heavy upfront lift. And a lot of people don't want to put the time aside to do it, but it saves you a tremendous amount of time over the life of your business. But one of the things that they don't do, a lot of people don't do is maintain the documentation. In the same way that you need to maintain your software product and put out releases, publish releases that make it better or they just keep the bugs out, keep it updated with the latest security fixes, or even if you just wanted to work with the latest version of WordPress core, documentation should be approached the same exact way. Your processes need to grow and develop as your business grows and develops. Yeah, and and I guess that for what you guys do with customer support, that goes both for your public or the your client's public knowledge-based documentation, but also your internal SOPs, your, your standard operating procedures. Absolutely. Public facing and internal documentation should get the same level of attention. It should definitely be kept updated on a regular basis. And it's so true. Definitely for productized services too. I mean, with audience ops, we're now, what, like almost two and a half years in, and I'm still revisiting, refining, rewriting entire parts of our processes. We've got like a whole folder of processes that are like now depreciated and we've, you know, phased in new ones and it's just constantly changing. That's good. Yeah, really important. So do you do anything like in terms of your tools? Like I know that there's a lot of customer support software out there, you know, like Help Scout, Help Spot, you know, Groove, all, all like, do you specialize in, in using one or do you require that your clients use one? Uh, so... I am a much, much bigger fan of, of strategy and process and planning than I am of one any one specific tool. Um, however, it just so happens that the majority of our customers are using Help Scout as a ticketing tool. It works well for us. I, I have a particular affinity towards it because it, it lends itself very well to our model in that it's an email-based tool the tagging functionality and several of the other features in the application actually lend itself very well to our distributed team model. My people are scattered all over the country, uh, the world, actually. So a lot of what they do there just matches up well for us. But we do not have any particular preference as far as tools that we use internally. Um, we're not using anything special. We use Trello for a lot of our things that we would, you know, as a part of our service, we send out a monthly report. One of the fears that we encounter with business owners is that they think they'll lose touch with their customers and their product if they're not in the support flow anymore. And that's just not true. Um, it's a very common concern, but that we address that in two ways. A, we send you a report monthly that shows you all of your trends, which items are most popular, which ones are getting the most attention, how many hours you're saving per month, how many tickets you're getting of this type versus that type. We send a very concise report. Well, first of all, that right there adds so much value to what you guys are doing. I knew that you did some sort of monthly reporting, but now now that you describe it, because it's not really just about outsourcing or you know somebody taking care of those tier one support issues, and that saves you a ton of time. But it's analyzing them and figuring out what's the most common question, and that you can translate right into figuring out which product or which feature you should build next or not build next. Your marketing copy, your your, your content marketing, like all that stuff, can stem from 
customer support. And when you're, even when you're doing it yourself, you're not really focused on those trends. You're just focused on like cleaning out your inbox. Yeah, absolutely correct. You can't really focus on it because you are, to your point, just trying to get the customers taken care of. And once you're done with that, do you really feel like going back in and doing this analysis? Most people don't. Some do. But yeah, we take care of that. So did you stay in touch with the pulse of your customers and what they need? It's awesome. Okay, so you're using like Trello to manage that stuff internally. Any other tools that you're using? Other than Trello, we're basically using a, a WordPress uh, knowledge base plugin internally for our, housing our own processes and walkthroughs and training documentation, things like that. Is that publicly available or like what's that called? Uh, so actually, I can't remember the name of the plugin, <laughs> but I can tell you it's a knowledge based plugin. It didn't cost us a dime. I literally needed something two years ago that met a certain set of criteria in terms of how the documentation was presented and needed the ability to control permissions on which team members could see which documents. And this plugin foot. Met, you know, met the requirement, and I just started using it. No offense to the, the plugin developer, but I just don't remember what the name is. Yeah, if you find it, let me know. I'll link it up in the, in the show notes. We're just going to wrap up here in a few minutes, but I wanted to kind of follow up on something you said about using Help Scout, and this gets into the weeds a little bit, but, you know, we use Help Scout pretty extensively at, at Audience Ops. I know a lot of our listeners use it for various things. Tagging is something that we haven't really used at all. Like, we... We do a lot of saved replies. We have multiple people in there. And so we have some workflows to automatically assign different clients to different managers. But I'm curious, to, like, do you have a standard strategy in terms of like tagging and organizing a customer support inbox with, with multiple team members? Actually, I do. Uh, so let me say two things. First of all, shameless plug, but this is very relevant information. There's a post at debbiepsas.net where we like to write and communicate to anyone who, who needs support in their business or support tips or advice for completely free, a lot of the lessons that we learn. And there's an article we published uh, about a year ago called Save Time and Money by Tagging Your Support Request. And it basically is about 500 words on all of the benefits associated with tagging, Help Scout or any other ticketing tool. Uh, most ticketing tools have it. But to answer your question, a lot of our clients don't tag and tagging. It basically allows you to convert your ticketing tool into a, so that it's queryable is it can be queried the same way that a database can be. It allows you to quickly put your finger on the pulse of what's trending and what's not trending in your queue. It also helps you more efficiently do the troubleshooting when something new comes in Whereas without tagging, you maybe maybe you perform a search. You're looking to see if, let's just say, somebody has a problem, a particular billing problem or an upgrade problem. They can't upgrade from a free product to a paid product. Well, you, the business owner, may know this off the top of your head or the developer. You may know this off the top of your head. But if you want to outsource this thing and, and, and put yourself in a position to scale, it should be portable. So this tagging allows you to hand the responsibility of troubleshooting over to anyone um, so that they can quickly look at all tickets that were tagged as, you know, upgrade or upgrade from free to paid or, you know, whatever phrase or one liner you would want to use. And they instantly have access to all of these previously handled support requests and the answers all there versus a query, which could take you a, a lot longer to do. That makes sense. So you ha you create tags for the most common issues that kind of come up. No, you actually want to tag. I mean, you could do it that way, Brian, but my recommendation is you tag everything because um, what you're doing is you're setting yourself up later so that your analysis can be very easy. Oh, uh, okay. So you just make it part of your process. That every single ticket, you're going to tag it with something. And then over time, you're going to build trends out of that. Over time, you're going to build trends out of that. You're going to find that maybe three months from now, and there's something that you are considering doing, and you want to know if it's something that your audience needs. Well, instead of mining through, you know, a thousand support requests and, and reading into the body of each one, which could take a very, very, very long time, um, you're just looking at tags and you're getting that percentage that match your query instantly. Um, I'll give you a really good example, real life use case. We had a customer, one of my clients that wanted a 
particular theme. The, the plugin that we were supporting wasn't playing very well with uh, this particular theme. And uh, the person who the customer felt very strongly that, hey, this is a very, very popular theme over at, you know, XYZ Marketplace. And everybody has it. It's the latest, greatest thing. You know, you should take care of this compatibility issue so that it works seamlessly. And the business owner was considering doing it. And I presented, I was able to quickly go into a tag search and prove to the, make the case to the business owner, not prove, but just make the case to say, look, if you're going to do this, you make your product compatible with this theme because this theme accounts for 30% of some of the conflicts that you're seeing versus the one that this customer is talking about, which we've only had a couple of instances reported. So it gives you that kind of power at your fingertips to be able to make decisions that are only going to be good for your business over time. Yeah. So it's not, again, it's like not just the time saved of answering one or two requests. It's the time saved of working on the wrong feature or working on the right feature. Absolutely. I'd say that's priceless. Awesome. Well, Kyle, thanks so much for this. It was really interesting to hear, you know, the story of how you came into this, but also these, uh, these, these tips of, of managing customer support effectively, scaling it up really, really helpful. So obviously folks can go check out wpsas.net. That's uh, that's your service and the site we've been talking about. Is there anywhere else people can connect with you? Sure. So I blog over from time to time at Kyle M. Brown, K-Y-L-E-M as in mango brown.com. And I'm at Twitter, K-Y-L-B-R-O-W-N. Yeah, we'll get those linked up in the show notes. Kyle, thanks. Talk soon. Hi, Brian. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. All right. Hey, did you know that you can get all of these show notes and highlights and links for every new episode sent straight to your inbox by going to productizepodcast.com and sign up for the email list. Yep, it's all there. And while you're at it, a five-star review on iTunes always helps the show find more listeners just like you and me. Okay, that does it for today. Late. <laughs>